Question one. How are members of the Constitutional Court chosen from Sten of Ashall? Uh, right. Uh, so, basically, uh, the Constitutional Court is pretty... Well, originally it was the game team plus Creaky, who he plays our Chief Magistrate. And Creaky is part of the, the Constitutional Court because so much of what we do and decide affects what he does so strongly. But also because he, um, he's he got a very good legal mind, so he's really good at thinking through some of the legal consequences. Uh, and, and also because we get on really well with Creaky. Um, so, in effect, the Constitutional Court is, us, is the game team plus Creaky. Now, since then, we've added Claire to the game team, who isn't here today because she's supposed to be camping in Wales. Um, so, in theory, there should be a fifth member of the game team who would be... What's Claire's character called? God, I can't remember. Um, I can't remember at all. I could find out. Uh, we don't have much interaction with her character, so it's, she was off in the field doing a job. So it's harder to know what her character is. Um... So in theory, at some point, you might suddenly notice a fifth uh, member of the Constitutional Court appears. Um, but it, it's never really... Because Claire's job is much more focused on the egregores, on the crew, on the field NPCs, the Constitution tends to be less relevant to her than her job. And she's never come to us with her. Uh, you know, she's never brought, as part of their game team functions, constitutional stuff. So effectively... The Constitutional Court is the game team plus Creaky. Apparently our character search isn't working at the minute, Matt. Is it not? It doesn't seem to be. No. Yeah. So oh, that is a problem for off this call, just to overly stress it, it, that. Sorry, yes, sorry. I was looking at what Claire's character name was, sorry. All right. Um, I what we were doing. But yeah, the crux of it is, is that, yeah, as much as that question was asked about in character, that is kind of an out of character answer. Um, we need to... Um, so it's been pointed out that Claire plays um, Kaya, General Secretary of the Civil Service. Yeah, I just got there. She does indeed. Well, I could confirm that is correct. Um, yeah, she's in charge of the Civil Service. Brilliant. Um, doo -doo -doo. So the second question. Some of these questions are going to be a bit more contentious, just to warn everyone in advance. Why does the Constitutional Court dislike debt so much? Um, with a well-implemented debt system, we would be able to expand our economy far more effectively. However, each attempt I have made towards this has been deemed unconstitutional. Edmundo, Archmage of Autumn. So, the fundamental mistake here is to think that because something would be good for the Empire, it would be good for the game. 99% well, of what we do as the Constitutional Court is really about what's good for game design. And there's nothing positive about debt from a game design, from our perspective. You, might, you, you are not wrong that there are a whole set of economic theories that say borrowing at low interest rates, which can invest to provide a return greater than the interest rates, are in the economic interests of the nation. There's no disputing that mathematical setup um, you know, that's just a set of mathematical facts, essentially, or economic facts, not mathematical. But but what's good for the empire is not what drives our, our decision. What We make our decisions on what's good for empire, the game, not empire, the in-character power structure. So the question is, your first, so the reason debt is made illegal under the Constitution is precisely because we think it would be bad game design. So then the reasons that we strictly enforce it is because we continue to think it would be very poor game design. And there's just, you know, there's lots of reasons I could illustrate that. Worth well, bearing in mind that we're not just pulling this out of our backsides. Maelstrom had a whole section of its economy based around the idea of debt to merchant houses. One of the And it was, it was yeah. not a good experience. One of the first NPCs that I ever played at Maelstrom was going out and collect and, and sorting out debts with Sakusa. And I think I spent two hours in the field with pen and paper working out what 10% of, of a base nine currency was um, <laughs> on, on a whole bundle of debt. Um, and that was... It's currency. Yeah. <laughs> 
We've so been down that road, and I don't want to go back down it. <laughs> there are conceptual questions around, you know, how you operate it and work it in, in game that, that turn out to be it's no fun at all. Um, there are game design questions around if you think that the amount of money available to the Senate is limited, and that creates game by making people argue over the amount of money. Do you make more gain by simply giving them more money to argue over? Well, no, you don't. You just it doesn't it doesn't produce a better gain, but you, you just yeah, in fact, produces a worse game. And then, as a friend pointed out when we were playing Potion Explosion uh, on Board Game Arena last night, what happens when the current group of senators borrow a huge amount of money and have a lot of fun, and then five years down the line, there's a whole set of new senators who have to pay back that money. And are now having no fun at all. Is anyone so, looking forward to austerity being introduced to the Empire game? Yeah. Anyone? No? Okay, let's move on. <laughs> the point is, though, ultimately, you have to subtly distinguish between what is good for the Empire and what is good for Empire the game. And ultimately, we're focused on the latter. So, third question. Um, with so many of the Empire's leadership at Anvil with the Constitutional Court... Um, what precautions have the court taken to prevent an armed insurrection by citizens seizing controls of the reins of state? Cormac Dunn of the Oathright. None. None whatsoever. This is kind of uh, asking uh, questions about... Writers write plots in which people seize the reins of the executive while everybody's at Anvil. It's it's Not kind of aspect. almost attacking the premise of the game in some way. I, I, I use attacking, I don't mean attacking, but... But to, to an extent, stuff that happens that affects the Empire happens at Anvil. That is the concept of our game, to an extent. Where it doesn't, where it's happening not at Anvil, it is either um, in the winds of war or the winds of fortune, or it is being is happening in an excursion out of Anvil. Um, our game is played in uptime, so it's not something we give a lot of thought of. Of like, what are we? What what would we do if if mysterious things happened off stage? It's like they're kind of not going to. Power to the people! I'm reminded of um, Citizen Smith, which I used to watch when I was a kid, which was about this kind of hopeless revolutionary who was all idealism and no practicality. And I, I, just the NPCs that don't come to Anvil, conceptually, their leaders have gone to Anvil. That, that's, that's you to, to enact change in the empire you go to anvil to do it the people who want change in the empire are the people who turn up at anvil there's an argument that if you're turning up at anvil to play a character who doesn't want anything to change or do anything different in the empire or anything there's this kind of well, you know that's so you could be them there's lots of reasons you could go but but the point is everybody who wants change is at anvil that is the conceptual conceit of the game world. So nothing has been done to solve a problem that within the conceit of the game world does not exist. There's no revolutionaries sat at home waiting to happen. All the revolutionaries are at Anvil. And you can see that. You know, If you go back and study even the last couple of years, there are people who've done highly revolutionary things at Anvil. But they did them at Anvil. Um, there's a, an interesting point there, though, where... The questioner seemed to think that like the court would take steps to prevent this happening. And, and you know, the, the, the court only has a really limited role. The court's role is to scrutinise the Senate motions and check that they are compatible with the, 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 the Constitution. That's literally its power. That's a really big thing it does, but it doesn't it is not also off running the country. The closest you would get to answering that argument was, well, magistrates would be there saying, oh, you can't raise an army. You know, if somebody in the marches wanted to raise an army without the permission of the Senate, they would be arrested by magistrates. They wouldn't be arrested by the Constitutional Court. The court is tiny and has a very tight focus. It isn't the suppression of non-existent revolutionaries. Agreed. So, question four. Who administers the magical oaths intended to ensure the impartiality of the civil service? What assurances can the court give that these oaths are universally applied and effective? Cormac Dunn of the Oathright. Andy, you had a lot to say on this. Yeah. <laughs> I did have a lot to say on that, but a lot of it was, was very Andy. Um... <laughs> but you're Andy now, so that's fine. That is, that is very true. 
Um, I don't think we do. We say that the oaths that the civil service take are magical in that they are separate to just oaths. I don't believe so. I think there was a lot of talk when the game started about oaths. Yeah, and magic. We oaths. wanted to. We wanted to establish beyond a shadow of a doubt that players out of character could know that the civil service. Well, you called them functionaries for a while actually during the design period, rather than we gave them the in character gloss of being civil servants. That the civil servants could be trusted. Uh, to not dick them about uh, and we talked about the O's and we talked a little bit about having magic clothes and I think some of the early in the early days some of the civil servants talked about taking magic clothes but as we develop the game a bit more we don't the problem with having a magic oath, making it a thing that is magical and done with rituals is that, that at that point it becomes something in the game you interact with I think uh, and that's not helpful because there is no scenario where we are going to run a plot, for example, in which a civil servant has become corrupt or evil or is acting yep. against the interests of the Empire. Because then while they are characters in the sense that they are people on the field at Anvil, they're not characters in that they're movers and shakers in the game. They are. Yeah, they exist to support the structures of the game. They don't exist to provide plot opportunities and interactions. And it's really important distinction. The one I often use is if I'm playing in, a, uh, if I'm going to a regular LARP game and an NPC runs in and goes, oh, there's a great army of orcs coming this way. They'll be here on Sunday, hundreds of them. They're going to lay waste to the camp. Everybody in the game intuitively knows what that means. They know that means that on the Sunday and the last day of the event, there will be a big battle against some orcs and that the orcs are going to roll up and we're all going to fight the orcs. Nobody says, hmm what if this scout is mistaken i shall go out and scry these orcs myself we understand intuitively that when the game organizers communicate something to you actually you kind of have to take it on trust because a it probably can't be checked physically you can't go over there because the monsters are all off in different roles you can't go and see this orc army that's coming on sunday you can't physically check these things and it probably isn't very valid to attempt to try. It's not within the context of the game that makes sense. The information that's provided to the organize, by the organisers about the setting that you are in has to be trustable because if it isn't, you can't trust anything. And because it's a game of the imagination, you can't then apply tests to what is true and what isn't. It's one of the reasons one of our internal dogma is that we won't lie to players. Uh, you know, certain very specific NPCs can, who are very clearly plot NPCs, like the Druge. But but we don't, we, the, the civil servants will never lie to the players because they are just an extension of the game and they are giving you game facts about the world. You have to and, be able to trust those to, facts. Yeah, yeah, you have to, otherwise the game doesn't work. Yeah. It's like playing Monopoly and going, well, how do I know that Euston Road will produce a rent of £150? It's like playing Monopoly and the banker like trying to shortchange you. Yeah, the game breaks down at the point where you can't trust the rules to be the rules. Yeah. There is some grey area, and I can see sometimes why there is uncertainty about it. I'm thinking about... So, for example, the stuff we put in a wind of fortune is true. If there is uncertainty about it, we'll say it is. We'll use phrases like "it's believed" or "it appears." Um, if it's not a hundred percent nailed down fact, but there are things in the game where there is some things that are presented in the game are not the actual facts of what is happening. I'm thinking particularly about some in character documents, for example. We maintain a space where there is intentionally some uncertainty about things. But it's almost invariably on in-character paper having been handed over under suspicious circumstances. I think. And we, yeah, we generally try and keep that well away from our civil servants. Oh, we keep that well as far away from our civil servants as we can. Yes, that's fair. Yeah. Most of them. Um, the point is, we don't ever want, um, you know, the, the foreign, the guy who supports the foreign civil servants, the, um, the ambassadors, to hand over a report to an ambassador and for the ambassador player to think, hmm, what if this civil servant has doctored this report? What if, can I trust what is written in here? A chunk of what we're trying to stress here is that there's no game to be had in trying to interrogate how honest are these civil servants. That is that is not the uh, the angle at which we're trying to put conspiracy or conspiracy plot or anything to yeah. you. 
Right, so next question. Who wrote, who actually wrote the original constitution? Sten of Ashenhall. It's an interesting question because we can never quite remember what each individual did. We didn't, we didn't take notes at the time. Um, I think I wrote the constitution. Rath thinks me and Creaky wrote the constitution. Rath's memory is generally the more reliable, but I think I wrote the document and then Creaky critiqued it and provided feedback. I mean, I've had feedback from Rath as well. Um, well, we did everything together in that Yeah, sense. I was going to say, I'm that, just thinking, back in I'm those days... <laughs> I'm pretty confident the point where you were finalising the, uh, the Imperial Constitution, I was also slightly more busy finalising the Conclave. Right. So I certainly had a look over it, but in my memory, regardless of what percentages is you and uh, you and john creek did the constitution together uh, and we sort of looked over it and i think i made some question about the odd bit here and there but it's certainly not a document that looks to my mind there's one that i've gone through with a fine tooth comb arguing about every full stop yeah and actually it's quite there's arguments you could make about it that it's there's areas where it clearly hasn't been edited that particular uh, which i think is a strength as an in-character document um i think and it's unfortunately we haven't got creaky here i think creaky originally thought the constitution would be more uh more like a list of rules like a yes and no's and my vision of it was very clear that it would be more like the founding of america's constitution it would be a philosophical document that we could that would be sufficiently ambiguous and sufficiently loaded with ideology and, and sort of highfalutin, we will achieve this, we will ensure this, that it would give us what we needed to be able to go back and go, that rule where you say every citizen's got to wear pants on their head, uh, that's unconstitutional because it removes the right to um, dignity. And that's a classic line. Uh, you you know, we guarantee the rights to prosperity, freedom and dignity. That is carte blanche for us as the game team to go, oh, you can't have that. And we don't, I'm not, well, in no way do we try to be, um, you know, we, don't, we, we try to be... That's what you were saying, that fundamentally our first responsibility is to the game experience. Yes. And it has to be because we're running a game. So sometimes it is really helpful to be able to say this thing that is good for the empire, but be terrible for empire the game. We can't allow it. And here's the bit of the constitution that's, that gives us a good in character explanation as to why we're not allowing this thing. But actually, and, and Andy hit some, a nail on the head there. What will happen is, um, and I think my knowledge is of the constitution is probably the only area of, of the game where I've got equivalent knowledge to you, Andy, of the actual wiki because your knowledge of the wiki is vastly better than mine. But we'll have a, a discussion, a motion will come in and we'll discuss it. And at the end of it, we'll all be like, rrr, rrr, and we'll, yeah, we're not allowing this. And then we'll be, and I'll be like, right, why are we not allowing it? I now need to go and find a reason from the <laughs> constitution. And then there'll often be a separate argument about what part of the constitution applies to why we don't allow that thing. But it's about, Tri drifting back to a question from the IC questions about the most contentious motions. The most contentious motions tend to be something where we're almost struggling to find a reason to disallow it in character, despite the fact that it, we do not want it out of character. But I'm often the one who's quite confident that I know why. We, we do occasionally go to the Constitution to find ways that we can allow something that we think would be good for the game, but which looks a little questionable. Constitution. Yes, that's fair. Yeah. So yeah, it does yes. kind of it's not a one-way street. It is, yeah, it is yeah. both about saying no to things we think were bad for the game, and also giving us the freedom to say yes to things on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. yeah, when it might be um, constitutionally sketchy, but we think would be good for the game. Yeah, which has come up a few times. But uh, I, the, I don't want to imply that the the document is just completely random. It, it, it's not. You know, there's a coherence and a logic to how the the rulings are made and applied, and and. You know, that we try to, and certainly if you study the constitutional rulings, you look at the things we said, they're giving you a good insight into what we, the game organisers, think is allowable within the game. So you know, studying the constitution is also like studying what the game organisers will let into the game and what they won't. So it makes sense to study it as an in-character document. It's not, 
It's not some fig leaf that we just go, oh, whatever. We've spent a reasonably long time on what was a six-word question. Um, so I'm going to move us on um, to a more contentious question, shall we say. <laughs> With the marchers already providing considerable, su considerable support to our armies via the breadbasket, could one use this precedent to allow one nation to aid in the support of another's armies in a more permanent fashion, effectively donating their army capacity to the other nations, at least assuming there are enough citizens in the receiving nation willing to actually form the army, of course? Septus Senatal Sentinel's Tower, Rykos. So, no on lots of levels. Um, I mean, first of all, it's important to appreciate that the breadbasket is a plot opportunity and it doesn't allow you to form a new army. It lets you reduce the loss of supply. And it doesn't even completely mitigate it. It only cuts it by half. So it's a special ability of the marchers to do that, to reduce the losses by half under certain circumstances. Uh, and part and it's, of that is about reifying the fact that the marchers are the breadbasket of the Empire. It's a very marcher-themed power yeah. in, in that regard, yes. It makes it more real that the marchers are the people who produce the lion's share of the spare food in the Empire. Now, if you were to say, well, if the marchers had two breadbaskets so they could completely support an Empire, could they then use that to raise a new Empire? And the, the answer would be no. Uh, that's not how the power works. Um, but also, you, you can't just have two... The key with plot opportunities is you go, oh, that's brilliant. Can we have it again? And the answer is no. Uh, you know, they are opportunities by, by design. You, you, you can't just go, well, great, we'll have 10, please. Um, they if don't they create... exist. If they weren't unique, if they weren't, you can do this this one time, we wouldn't allow you to do anything that wasn't covered by um, Sinecure's ministries. And Sinecure's and ministries, I wouldn't even allow great works at that point. I'd be really cautious about them. Yes, uh, but they're intended, plot opportunities create vibrant opportunities in the here and now that are unique and distinct. So it gives us, we've got the toolbox of sinecures, ministries, great works for players who just go, this is what I want to do and this is how I want to do it. And then we have plot opportunities so we can throw things at the players which are unique and distinct and engaging. They're not designed to be reproducible. This, this, um, sorry. Yeah, go on. There's an element I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about this a little bit and, and sort of looking at the question. We'd start by asking ourselves, should we just give people more army support? To start with. What, what, and, and we'd say, no, we wouldn't. We wouldn't just give more. For the same reason, we don't just give more money to the Treasury. At that point, one nation is sacrificing itself so that a more important nation can have more armies. Mm. And we're really cautious about that our nation or we are less important than another nation or another group of people. So we will take a hit so that they can have a Benny because that's not a game formulation that we are very happy with as a general idea. Now that doesn't mean we don't do plots in which somebody can take a hit in the short term to give somebody else a short term benefit. But the idea that, that say Navarre would permanently lose one of its armies so that the league or Orison can have another army just doesn't, yeah, it's not an area where I would be comfortable taking our plot particularly. Agreed. And, and also, if you, think, if you think about it, what it would do is blandify the game. Mm. So a great example of that, if you look at the recent acquisition of a new territory, I can't remember what it's called now, the New Russian Ossium. Territory. Ossium. Thank you, because I can never remember anything. Um, there we presented the players with a whole load of possibilities, but one of them was talking about what would be the military gains if this was declared Rushkin? What would be the military gains if this was just declared Dornish? And what we're able to do there is use the unique characteristics of the nation to go, well, if it was made Urizen, it would have these magical benefits. If it was made Dornish, it would have these military benefits. If we said, you can make this uh, territory Dornish and that will increase the army cap of the Dornish, and then they can just give that army cap to anybody. Actually, what you would do is make that question, that original decision of who gets osium less interesting not more interesting the more you allow people to share things the more bland the game becomes and the less distinct the nation becomes and so the game becomes just less engaging less interesting it would be interesting to see how different the military and senate game might be if we just said the empire can support 15 armies or 20 armies 
As a I, I, so I, get those armies is up to the players. I think we would very quickly enter into a situation where everything is just shared out equally and fairly in in, in the most fair way number. possible. Yeah, yeah, but you can always pick a difficult number. Actually, I'm redesigning but, the Empire Military Council, but I can see ways we could make that more. We could make that quite interesting. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not enthused because I've seen the way that things. Because uh, we could talk about things that we've done, where where stuff has been automatically done fairly. Take, let's take Dawn for a second. Uh, it's not the case at the moment, um, but it was the case in year one, um, where Dawn had three senators and three armies. And it was all all the nations are set up in the same way, such that all their senators vote on all their generals. So, or they don't vote; they need to come to a unanimous decision. So, the problem with that Dawn saw in its first year was that every senator, I think March is exactly the same situation. There were exactly the same number of senators as generals, so every senator just simply agreed, "I will have my pet general." So it ceased to be that senators decided on generals as a whole. So you got a a more, perhaps a more compromised candidate, and moved to a model whereby every senator picked their own general. So what you saw was a lot of generals who came from the same group as their senator, in a way that you don't always see with other um, groups who might be more trading off something, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, to get a complexity of political gain, you want to avoid a situation where everyone can have one of something. Yeah. That's a disaster. You and it, yeah, and I think that same applies if, if you've got a pool of armies. And yes, you're right. If we could say, like, if, if there were 25 armies to share out, mm -hmm. then between the 10 nations, then yes, they wouldn't be evenly established. But I also am I'm pretty confident that no nation would only get one. It would be five nations with two and five nations with three. We're yeah. back to what? We're back to the question of while something might be good in character for the Empire, it would absolutely be great for the Empire if they could all support each other's armies. It wouldn't be good for the game in that it would mean things like losing territories became less interesting and less relevant and less important yep. because you could always support the armies you've got unless you lose half the empire. And at that point, the story and the impact of, say, um, the Druze invasion of Faroz or the loss of Summer Suak or the decision to give... Um, the, the hard, the hard choice to give Spiral to away was when, made harder yeah. by the fact that it was going to cause... Um, the Urizen nation to lose supply. Then on that turn army. around and just support the Urizen army anyway through a different method. It feels like you would be detracting a lot from the decision that was made in character by those players. Yeah, yeah. We talked about this. One. Yeah, Sorry, but that man. principle actually is one we talk a lot about, isn't it? That mm. if you can just, if we make a, if the players make a massive important decision that's got a massive important consequence, and then you're just then able to mitigate that consequence and make it go away. What you actually did was undermine their, the importance of their decision. You actually made their decision less significant. Uh, less that's significant. not to say that we won't realise we've overdone the consequences of a decision. I'm thinking of a specific one here. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what we didn't do is remove the big impact of that. We realised that we'd added an impact that wasn't actually fun or interesting or in any way really relevant. And then we worked out a way that if people cared enough, they could get rid of it. Uh, but yeah. what we didn't do was roll back the big significant one. Yeah. Anyway... Oh, we didn't roll back any of them, actually. We just put in an opportunity for people to choose to uh, to take a short-term blow to get a long-term benefit. Anyway. So, next question. Why is the throne and many other positions a lifetime appointment and not one that lasts a set period of time, as others perhaps seven years per throne until another vote? So I kind of want to split this up into two things, which is sinecures and the throne. Which are our two lifetime, our main two lifetime appointments, I think. I'm uh, I'm just thinking with a certain amount of nostalgia about how much fun that thing we did a couple of years ago, Matt, where we tried to where you automated the process of who's in a title. Oh yeah. How much fun that would be if we had like eight or nine more different durations that somebody could be in a title for. <laughs> yeah. A whole However, chunk of that piece of work was about knocking us down to lifetime and year and annual appointment as the only two appointment methods. There is a third. Oh, conclave. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Oh, conclave is conclave is just lifetime under a different guise. Uh, no, um, it's uh, twelve months versus annual. Summer titles are appointed. Oh, yeah, sorry, anyway, yes. Twelve months. I, I'd forgotten that one. I was thinking about the other um, oddity, which is the wayleaves, which are one event. Yep. 
Yep. The gist is that we are not keen to add more durations that a title can last for than the ones we've got at the minute because we already have too many. Yeah, there's also a lot of administrative burden when you've got a lot of particularly particularly sinecures. There are a lot of little sinecures that are little titles, and if you are appointing them constantly, that is a bit of a pain. So I think the point there is that something we touched on, which we don't always mention is that sometimes we'll rule something out because it's just so much of a pain in the ass for us to administer it we're like oh dear god this will be an epic nightmare of, of of hassle for us and and at the point where and it's not at the end of the day that's our job we're here to run the game for players but at the point where we think this will be so much work it will be impacting the stuff we can do for other players there's an obvious example that springs to mind immediately we've had more than one attempt to set up a national lottery or an imperial yeah. lottery yeah. and our general yeah. response to that is you are perfectly fine to set up a lottery but we are doing nothing to support that because it is a vast ball lake yeah yeah we're not selling all the tickets and collecting no. all the money and no, we're not being responsible for that money we're not we're not storing it we're not making sure it goes to the right person you can do what you like we are not yeah. running a, a an imperial lottery for you yeah not a chance because it's just a huge amount of unfun work um and would so impact. What is the, th but the throne is unique in that there's only one of them it's hard to argue that we it, anything about it is about the amount of work involved why is it a lifetime appointment? And that's an interesting one. And... Uh... Not why I argued for it to be a lifetime appointment. I can talk about that if you like. Yeah, go for it. So um, it's meant to be the most impactful title in our game. Yeah. It's supposed to be there as an example of the ultimate in character ambition, if you will. It's not quite, but you, but you see where I'm going. Um, and I also think it's important to have a level of, of continuity. Uh, and I think it's important that it's got tenure. I want the person, the player who becomes throne to be able to be the throne and not constantly worried about the pressures of seeking re-election. Now, that's not to say that they can they can run roughshod over the rest of the players because they can be revoked. But I just don't want a chunk of the throne's experience to be about making sure that they can get elected next year. And I don't want the throne to become effectively a... I don't know. I don't. I, I, I don't want it to be being elected annually because the drama of who is going to be thrown is removed at that point. Because you're only going to be thrown for a year. Um, it doesn't matter. It's just another title. And these are all solid reasons why I want a throne that has the ability to be thrown, unless people put a large amount of work into stopping them being thrown. Yes, and it should be a big decision for the Senate for, as well. Yeah. Uh, yes so the shorter the time it serves for the shorter the impact of the decision so you're actually making you're giving the, the senate a less important decision to make now weighed against that larp time scales are considerably compressed one event is a bit like a year in the real world in some respects if you think about how long after your character dies it takes for people to forget you it's usually about a day. If you're lucky, it's about an event. If you're really super famous, it might be two events. Um, but, you know, pretty quickly, you're just yesterday's character. The, the game moves very, very quickly and, and time scales. Think how quickly a castle is built, an army is raised. Everything is, is heightened because that makes for a good game. But LARP in general runs to very fast time scales. Um, and I think... If I had my time again, if I had, if, you know, if I was designing Empire again from scratch, I might well argue for a high king, a Celtic high king model that you serve for seven years and then you are, you can't serve again. You're just done. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think I'd lose the argument, but if the argument is actually about how long somebody can play that role in a way that is enjoyable and bring, you know, enthusiasm and drive and ambition to the title more than it is about, oh, well, it should be re-elected every X years because that's democratically appropriate. I think, to me, the arguments are more about drama and how long you can enjoy playing the role. And, and I think the jury's still out on that. You You're... Know, ironically... Boom. Andy, you look weird. Oh, right, right. Uh, oh, because of the way the sun is hitting you, like <laughs> it's one of the disadvantages of living in a garret. 
the sun streams in through my yeah, it was just the way it was hitting your beard you just had this sort of white portion oh, yeah. of the front of your face no worries. Sorry. sorry if that bar has a weakness it's that the game is built with the um the assumption that the game will be enjoyable to play and you know it's an incredibly successful game there's you know well over two thousand players at the last event so it's a pretty fair assumption for most players most of the time but you know in, in the instances where we get it wrong that has consequences where parts of it aren't enjoyable to me if i was going to go back and redesign empire i'd probably spend a lot of time chatting to ross about her experience of being the throne to think about how long i thought was a good time to let someone be the throne for i wouldn't I wouldn't start with the presumption that it should be forever. I would want to think about that as an open question. But a year would be useless. A year, it, it yeah. wouldn't be the throne if it was a year. So um, we'd have another tiny problem. It's a, and it's entertaining how these decisions can have knock-on effects. We had nineteen historical thrones. Yeah. If the throne could only serve for seven years we would arguably need 53 thrones. Now, obviously, some of them would get re-elected, but at that point, we'd certainly have to have had more historical thrones or longer interregnum periods to give it some breathing space. Or a shorter history. One of the things that's really ah, fascinating yeah. about Empire is that 350 years feels like a really chunky amount of imperial history. You feel like, yeah, that, that's credible. If we'd said the Empire was formed 35 years ago, and then I'll be like, what, last week? That's incredibly short. It feels like a mayfly. When you're looking backwards through his, through in-character history, it's got to be a chunky amount. It's got to be a kind of amount of history that feels like real-world amount of history. But actually, a LARP amount of history would be an empire that had been around for about 60 or 70 years, because that would have had 20 emperors, 20 thrones, some have been assassinated, some have been removed, some, you know... If, I remember that one of the very first discussions we had before we go on to the next question, before Graham, uh, you know, kills us. Uh, one of the very first discussions we had about the history of the Empire was it's not being a thousand years. Yeah. Which it's... is almost the default amount of time that anything <laughs> it takes for anything to happen in LARP normally. Anytime you open up a setting. Yeah. novel and they talk about an empire that's been around for a thousand years, just laugh. Just laugh. Very, very, very few empires in the real world last that long. It's much easier for a fantasy author to write a thousand years of blah history. Stuff doesn't last that long in the in the real world, let alone you know. And, and so I think, um, I, I we but, certainly but, lose a hundred years out of imperial history, and I think it would still feel relevant. Two hundred and seventy years. Yeah. 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 I think once you get under two hundred, it starts mm. to feel a bit. And if you go under 100, you start getting players going, oh, can I be over 100 years old and be a bit of a round when it was, and you're like, no, no. That's, that's, that's we should no move on. on really we badly we should move on. So actual discussions. we are now on, uh, we're coming up to an hour and three quarters. Um, yeah. So we've, that, we've done all the questions that we were asked in advance. So I've now got eight questions from the chat, but I'm going to limit us to the two hour mark. Okay. Um, I if I'm honest, I'd rather go to about two hour fifteen because we had about a fifteen minute period in the middle in which we were putting trousers on and uh, doing gay thingy. This is going to make two one hour videos. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think uh, okay, fair enough. Also, we've waffled quite a lot about how long. Oh boy, is. have we? But yeah, it's, uh, certainly the the first one ended at about the one hour mark. So fair yeah. enough. So I'm going to run through some of these. My point is, I was trying to bring up that we might not get to all the questions from the chat from um, everyone in chat who might get. And I need to waffle less. Yes. So next question, uh, I have reordered some of these as well. Um, what other ring fences are there around the IC actions to protect the quality of the game as a LARP? Ooh, good question. We won't let anybody have the legally protected power to instruct other players what they have to do. That one comes up a lot. Yeah. Um, we won't allow air. We, we mentioned it actually earlier in the stream. We are very, we crack down immediately on anything that will, that will cause some sort of frivolous behavior hike. Because from our experiences in Maelstrom, uh, among other places, it's fun for about an event if everybody has to wear a certain type of hat. Yeah. And, and then after that, it's not fun. It's yeah. worse than in, like, in character diseases for unfunness. <laughs> uh, do, 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 those are two specific things I can think of. But interestingly, all of that works through the application of the Constitution. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
I don't think there are many other ring fences. Um, so your obvious other ring fence, if you like, is um, to protect the quality of the game. I think it's like Arcane Projections, I think is possibly another fence that we put in place. Yeah, the rules of magic, if you like, or, or and our application thereof. It's it seems another area whereby we do say no to stuff because it would make bad game. I think there's sense. another point as well here. Um, I mean, the law is arguably an extension of the constitution in a sense, in that sense. Um, but it, interestingly, the law doesn't prevent you from doing bad things. It just penalizes you for doing them. You can still murder someone. You just incentivize not to do it by the fact that you know you will have to dodge the rosas ironically i think the social contract is a big factor people don't go out rolling camps at night because we tried really hard when the game was created to say this game is not about rolling camps at night and i think a lot of people but the civil servants people just buy into the social contract of the empire by and large um and so that arguably that social contract of how the game is played which is subtle and not very tangible has a big impact in keeping it um fun and, and enjoyable to play uh, but the only thing that really literally just puts blocks down is the constitutional court i think oh and arcane projection but i guess the counterpoint is and this is what i, th I think makes empire very unusual as a game you can pass a motion that changes the laws of the game. You can change the in-character laws of Empire. In theory, you could get an arcane projection that identified a new law of magic. In practice, that's very, very difficult, but in theory, it could happen. Um, so arcane projections and Senate motions give you a way to change the game itself. So not surprisingly, we put ring fences around that and control what changes you can and can't make. We don't put change ring fences around who you can and can't sell uh, green, green iron to because that's not a change to the game world. That's just a character action you take in the game world. You only need ring fences. If you've designed your game well, you only need ring fences at the point where the players can change the rules of the game, not at the points where they're just playing the game. Yeah. So the ring fences are just there at the points where the players can change things. I think that's reasonable. Um, right. I wasn't sure I was going to ask this one, but hey-ho, we're doing it anyway. Um, in a, in a follow-up to the question about the oath civil servant stakes... If not magical oaths, what handy shorthand should I use IC to inform a player whose character is shouting about the about a corrupt magistrate um, what they are suggesting isn't part of the game? Uh, that that what it's not, it's not part of the game. I think what you all you do is you need to reframe it as that the magistrate's made a mistake. Yeah, I, I would, um, NPCs are humans. So I think I I'm trying to take stuff from context, but I suspect the word shouting is the um is the important thing. That they may be like oh, how do I put this? They may be rallying around and and organizing some kind of mob to say that this magistrate is corrupt. How do you defuse that? Um, so I mean, I would certainly there's a couple of things I would do there. <laughs> I find this fascinating. And we've had this, we've had some of these discussions before. Firstly, you can make reference to oaths. As Andy pointed out earlier, all oaths have some magical quality to them in, in Empire. We know that the civil servants and the magistrates swear an oath to be, you know, non-partisan and to uphold the, the, the laws and the constitution faithfully. Um, but that doesn't so that in theory would give your character a reason why you'd think, well, that seems unlikely because I you know, you've then got the evidence that you see or don't see in front of you when you're in the field. Um, the question becomes, you know, is it possible for a magistrate to be corrupt? Well, out of character, no. Is it possible for them to be corrupt in character? Theoretically, yes. It's not breaking the laws of physics of the game world that a magistrate could be corrupt. There's I, also a difference I, between corruption and doing something wrong. 
I'm certain that magistrates will do things wrong because because they're human. They're not perfect. Yeah. Um, but it's fascinating. We live in a world in which people think coronavirus is spread by five G. More, you know, uh, radio towers. You know, we live in a world of tinfoil hat wearers. Um, people believe all sorts of absurd and ludicrous things that sensible people think you're an idiot. You've got tinfoil hat on. So, and, you know, we, we, we can all kind of cope with that. Whereas, oddly, when people believe things that are palpable nonsense in a LARP game, it often is more damaging to the fabric of the game in a way that it apparently doesn't damage reality for people to believe. Guess the point is that by saying that there aren't magical elves that protect the civil service, what you don't have to do is take that person aside and say, out of character, in the game world, it is impossible for that magistrate to be corrupt. It's like rapiers, almost. Corruption exists in the game. You can role play that you believe a magistrate is corrupt. They are not corrupt. Uh, I'm 99% confident. We've certainly not briefed them to be corrupt. But you can role play that you think that magistrate is corrupt if you want to. We're not telling you you can't. It's not an out of character problem. No ref is going to come over and say you can't claim that magistrate is corrupt. Yeah. Because the potential exists in the game. But we're just telling you out of character that whatever is going on in that scenario it is not because there is a sinister plot being run in which the magistrate is corrupt and is uh, is taking bribes to the vague. Yeah, we're not running that plot. That plot is not running in our game. Um, but that's just what we're telling you out of character. You know, in character, your character should have some evidence of years and years of living with the magistrates, of knowing that, that, that they're, they're largely unbribable, that they appear to be what they are, largely incorruptible. And I would just go with, you know, yeah, they take out all the evidence seems to be they're not corrupt. But if somebody was saying, oh, this person's corrupt, you know, look into it. Maybe there's been a miscarriage of justice. There's the oath, right? We'd like to see it publicised widely so that it can be corrected. So, can new imperial bodies be established or disestablished, I see? And what would it take or are they baked into the rules permanently? Okay, well, first of all, let's say, can they be disestablished? Can you get rid of the Synod? Can you get rid of the Conclave? No. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we, when we look at, let's imagine the Senate passes a motion saying, we disestablish the Synod, we're just removing the Synod. We would look at that and go, is this game going to be loads more fun after that's removed and the synod is gone and all the priest game is gone and all of the religion game is gone and all the the, the the philosophical and religious and moral and political side of the synod is removed is the game better or worse and we'd be like well it's a massive ton worse so then we go what well, okay we're not letting this pass what does the constitution say oh no it says no so disestablishing something would be astonishingly difficult because we'd have to be convinced that it was dreadful for the game. And, and actually, assuming that you're talking on that scale, needless to say, you could, I would not be averse if somebody was to raise a, a, a cogent decision to get rid of the gatekeepers, say. Yes, depends what you mean by imperial institution. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think they mean conclave, senate, synod, uh, bourse, military council. council. And of those, the, the two most vulnerable are, I guess... Hmm. Without the military council, I'm not sure how you would control armies, and you would need to come up with something for that before you do that. Um, it's boss conclave. Boss and conclave. Synod Sy Sy aren't terribly vulnerable because they have the ability to veto anyone's attempt to disestablish them. It's um, not really about the in character <laughs> element, though, is it? I mean, the fact the synod can veto their own dis 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 dissolvement. Yeah, I, I don't think we. Really I don't think we'd let them. I don't, I, don't, I don't think we would say we, we, you're going to stop us, call our bluff <laughs> um, I disagree with you that any of the houses are more vulnerable than the others they're all baked into the constitution as a solid part of the game to allow different types of players to exert different I, types of political power over the game in a way that creates game, I cannot see a circumstance where I think getting rid of one of those, the big five makes the game better in any way I agree. the only thing to think about the fact if we thought the game was better off without them, we'd just take we wouldn't have put them in I wouldn't have put them in and we would take them out you and have some freedom to there is some opportunity to change how they operate yeah to reduce their impact we've talked a lot in fact it's baked into the history 
to go back to Leontes for a second, that the relationship between the Senate and the Senate has ebbed and flowed, that one has been more powerful than the other throughout history, for example. There are certainly plenty of opportunities to tweak and twiddle and try stuff out, and we try and be as open-minded when they come in as possible. Um, but getting rid of them... And it's yeah. a similar reason that I think we are unlikely to ever see a new body of state that is on par with those five. I just can't imagine what it would look like even. Let's just stop a minute and look at our five bodies of state. Politics, religion, war, magic, economics. What sixth entity are you going to put that is up there with politics, religion, magic, war and economics? What was the sixth one that is equivalent to those five? If somebody put forward a motion that brilliantly identified a sixth area of human endeavor for, that would make sense in empire, that was of equivalent magnitude and significance and importance <laughs> to those five, I'd be like, amazing. They'd created a whole new area of game, and we'd really explore that. Angus, was... Angus Fogey suggests sport. Okay, cool. That's uh, politics. Uh, it suggests also art. Politics. Okay, Possibly so... Yeah, with the best will in the world, neither sport nor art even remotely come close in the modern world to comparative importance of economics, war, faith. They just don't. Um, now... You could create uh, some kind of imperial institution for the arts. You could create some kind of imperial institution for uh, what those other things are, sports. You can create the Imperial Olympics Committee. And if you've got players really excited and, and cool about it, that'd be great. And after we give you a bit of support as it got, you know, we try and help you grow it. But the idea that we treat it as the sixth house of government. Of the An world. example, actually, would be the Liberty Pact. It's got major impact on the game. It has kind of created a whole new group of people all doing exciting stuff around international politics and liberty and what have you. But what we didn't do was then expand it up so that there are imperial liberty pact delegates from every nation who are appointed by a special method and have a series of unique political powers. Yeah, because it doesn't warrant it. It doesn't another, warrant it. Another example, Andy, would be the foreign and the ambassadors. Mm -hmm. the ambassadors because they often work together as a team they yeah, collab yeah. operate and collaborate you know there's a lot of kind of that there's in theory there could be the foreign office but actually and, and you could argue diplomacy is as big a deal as the other five it is, but it slots quite effectively into the different purviews of the synod the senate and the conclave arguably diplomacy is something that the existing houses of power are involved in and do it's not something separate to them? Yeah, it's relevant to the boss, it's relevant to the military council, it's relevant to the conclave, it's relevant to everybody. Um, so, yeah, we, we do can't... a lot with titles and the new sodality stuff that we brought in, but making a whole new sixth arm of the game is not. It, it, I, it's very difficult to see how that would work. Hmm? It's like trying to invent a new colour. Like, what would this colour be? Um, but in theory, if you came up with something that, that and, and built something over time that genuinely had the same weight and significance in the game, then, then I'd look at it. Look at it it would have to have the same potential impact on the game as the Senate, the Synod, the Conclave and the Military Council. Yeah, and the boss. Yeah, and the boss, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so there you go. Not impossible, very difficult. Right. I nice. often, go on. Yeah. I often think questions like that are really like trying to put the horse in front of the car. It's like, if you want to create an institution for the arts in Empire, create that thing. And then look at how you can expand it and make it cooler. Don't go, right, I want it to be like this, to be as important as the Senate. How do I make it as important as the Senate? It's make an interesting it... question about how you phrase questions. I'm thinking about some of the emails we get. It is always better to talk specifically to us about something than generally. Yeah, yeah. What is it you actually want to do? Mm. 
Yeah. Because we and Leontes in particular are very resistant to questions that are like, is it possible to do something like this without telling us what exactly it is? Yeah, I'm do? I'm very suspicious when I get a question that says, Oh, what are what are the rules on what how far I can push this? And I just want to turn back around and ask, what are you trying to do? Tell yeah, me what, what you're it? trying to do. Because the worst thing in the world is me telling you yes what you're trying to do works because you've told me a lie about what you're trying to do and then you try to do the thing expecting it to be some kind of gotcha that's sort of like haha i did this thing you weren't expecting me to do with this knowledge and i then have to turn around and go well then it doesn't work <laughs> the ability to create your olympics committee and your arts council already exists in the game their powers of the senate arguably the synod could provide some support in that area you could make a conclave order whose whole political belief was all about the importance of competition uh house titles represent uh or about art for example so there are things in the game we can do to that. Making the senate. imagine if the imperial bard met with other bards of other nations and, and had powers to you know over the arts to determine which music could and could not be published <laughs> which songs could and could not be sung the ability but, to announce le legal restrictions on the on the, on art a censor if you will yeah that sounds awesome yeah it would fit within our framework as well it would be announcement in the senate um yeah. and it would effectively be abrogating the giving the power to make legal decisions about music it'd be yeah. fascinating i would love to see some people being arrested for singing i don't know songs about goblins <laughs> it could be awesome but I don't think the evidence is there that you would get hundreds of players really passionate about developing that kind of control in a competitive way. You wouldn't get politics. This is yeah. your opportunity to prove us wrong. Yes. Yeah, roll on the Imperial Censors. Yeah, absolutely. The Imperial Arts Committee, Censor sounds so negative. You want to give oh, it a bit of spin. So that would be my highborn uh, <laughs> tendency. Yes, quite. Rather than moving on to the next question, there's a follow-up to it been pasted in the chat, which I'm going to ask, and then after you're done with that, we'll we'll move on. Which cool. is this follow-up is so there's no way that the apothecary's sodality can ever have control over legal decisions of potions. No, I just said, as I said with the example of the Arts Council, the Senate would create a title called the the, the Master Apothecary, ah. perhaps, who would have the legal ability to make potions legal or illegal. Because yeah. that is a power that the Senate has. The power can devolve powers to other individuals. They'd have the legal power to say, you cannot make this, this potion is illegal to own. Uh, whatever the restriction is on legal. In theory, you could do a similar ability in the Conclave, where somebody would have the ability to interdict only the products of apothecaries, for example. And we would have a discussion at the point where you said they have both abilities. I think that would be I, th I think we've raised problems before where you have a limited use of a power. I just okay so we're in disagreement I think it is absolutely yeah. fine to give somebody the legal power to say that you can determine which potions are legal or illegal because I think they're clearly defined I think um, that I'm I'm relatively with. okay with I, I think weirdly it's the interdiction that I have more of an issue with but either way so we would argue about it but it is perfectly feasible to make a character whose power is to determine uh, is to announce that certain potions or preparations are now illegal and then to remove that illegality from it and the senate would still be able to do it i mean you wouldn't uh, in the same way that the uh, while the imperial quartermaster can decide which armies get resupplied that doesn't remove the senate's ability to do the same now the thing is that in and of itself wouldn't create a house of power for apothecaries what you oh, then no 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 nobody's creating create some sort of internal politics about how that apothecary was selected and that is not easy because basically you would be asking PD to do a ton of work. A lot that the houses each the, conducting elections and conducting the business of a house, uh, a political house of the five houses. Well, yeah, is a ton of work for PD. But you know, effectively, at the point where this thing was gathering momentum and was gaining traction, and so people... you could certainly do it with the existing methods. You could have it as a senate appointment. Sure. But that's not an independent political house. That is true. That is not an independent political house. But we just spent 10 minutes saying that it's really unlikely you would ever get to make an independent political house. And my point is, it's hard to get beyond that to the next step. But the, the trick is not to worry about that and to focus on the bits you want right here, right now. If you want an apothecary's guild with a, the, them in charge of what potions are illegal and illegal, that could be done easily through the Senate. 
super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Barely an inconvenience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pottery skills are tight. Okay, next question. How did you come to an agreement about the overall balance of the nations at game start? Number or our number of armies, uh, territories, boar seats, etc. This is more game design than 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 anything else. But but the question is there. I, I, I think the answer is we just left it to Graham. <laughs> I didn't do <laughs> half of those. <laughs> what we, did is we, uh, we had a lot of discussions. We got a vague idea. In fact, we at one point had a table in which we laid out each of the ten nations and the five houses of power. Yeah. And we put numbers between five and one into each of those things. And that helped us get an idea that Dawn and the Marches, for example, would be strong militarily. Urizen would be strong in the Conclave, although we never actually worked out what that meant. <laughs> the, and, and that the League would be economically powerful and stuff like that. And then we largely just played it by ear. I'm really sorry to tell you that it was largely a lot of guesswork. Yeah, there was yeah. a lot of finger in the air going on. Yeah, um, but one of the things we didn't try and do was balance all the nations against each other. No. Because there's ten of them. Yeah, and because it just depends on who plays them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, weight but... weight of character of the people who make senator is much more important than than the initial yeah. starting setup of power. Um, yeah. The yeah, you can do a lot with a with a very small amount. I'm trying to think of a reasonable example. Uh, Urzan, Urzan, Urzan has one voice in the military council. Yet still manages to um, to get the, to to have some serious impact there. The Probably more impact there than they have in the Senate. The Imperials for most of the game had no voice in the Senate, yet still managed to be a yep. a solid piece of impact over the political uh, direction of the Empire. Yeah, the League and the Military Council, even though again it's one of the smaller military nations or has been historically, has often been very impactful in the Military Council because of the personalities involved. The, the reality is that balancing these things out is is a mugs game. What we tried to do was try and ensure that there would be bits of game for everybody, and that they would the bits of game would roughly line up with what we were selling in the in the background. You don't shouldn't turn up at the first game and discover that Urizen have no magical abilities, but are the preeminent military force in the empire, because that's not what the background material gives you the impression of. Um, but actually, you know, ultimately it comes down to what the players play. We have occasionally, you know, uh, uh, we sometimes think, oh, let's give... Sometimes, what we, we don't rebalance. What we do is think, let's give this nation some more game. Let's give them something. You know, occasionally we will run a plot opportunity where we give a, a nation something because we want to give them more game because we've identified... A reasonable example is probably Urizen. Um, if we think about... Um some of the changes that have come in for Urizen recently, we've thought that was a good idea because it made Urizen feel more like powerful mages, which is yep. the the niche of the game that they effectively occupy more than anyone else. Combination, of, I mean, I don't know how noticeable it is, but within the last year or so, the last year of the game, we made a big effort to have more involvement of Eternals and powerful wizards turning up with magical solutions and offering magical things. The whole failure on thing that led into Imperial, uh, into Urizen law was a an opportunity to, to reinforce the idea that the Urizen have magical opportunities that other nations don't have. Yeah. And but we've also, done the other ways as well. We do it the other way as well, of course. How many times have we been asked if the new army the Empire is raising can be a magic army? Uh, uh, how many events have we had? every time. <laughs> 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 Not quite, but almost every time. We always say no, because the magic army is so. part of Urizen's magical swoosh. Yeah. Everybody gets a no, because... Being good at magic is Urizen shtick. So, you know. Yeah. Anyway. So that's your answer. We didn't, we just talked about it a lot, <laughs> made some decisions. And long, we predict how long the game was discussion. going to go is the main point. If we didn't try and, we didn't drive ourselves mad trying to predict every socioeconomic yeah. If we had realised the game was different, I mean, I imagine I'd probably have argued to give Wintermark another army. We'd realise that I mean, a massive warrior nation, maybe with hindsight. After I mean, they're. Years. I think they're third or fourth on the list. It's like the dawn and the marches are the top two, but I, th I think Wintermark are are next. Yeah, the three. They were one of the. It all varies, but basically, yeah. we didn't try and second guess. I mean, they're down to two territories, but they've got three armies and are not decaying. So you know, they're 
they're still way up. Um, boom, 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 boom. Right, that's that question. I've got a few more. Oh, do I have a few more? We're at ten past ten past two hours. That one that I can see right there. Sorry, how much of a pain was the whole Liberty Pack saga? Were you surprised by how quickly <laughs> it was resolved? I want to say it wasn't a pain at all. It was a joy to watch. Um, the biggest piece of work that we had to do was thinking about a couple of the legal ramifications, and the biggest piece of work we had to do on the Liberty Pack was briefing the NPCs for the Liberty Pack meeting. Yeah. I think. Um, I'm not surprised how quickly it was resolved. I will admit that I was surprised by how it was resolved. Um, I had bet a shiny 10 pence that the Empire was not going to go for the Liberty Pact because of the damage it was potentially going to do to the economy and to their international politics. I was surprised by the fact that the Liberty Pact ended up with the Empire enthusiastically joining up with it. And I'm really looking forward to the ramifications of the Liberty Pact. I was really surprised when they went for it before they'd done the appraisal. Mm. Yeah. Surprised me. It was like normally the empire's pretty cagey about not leaping before they know what the consequences of leaping will be. But they, they used the appraisal on something else. They had something else they, they wanted did. to do. Yeah. With it. yeah. And then they stepped into the abyss. Uh, and all credit to them. All credit to them. Oh, Liberty Pact, not a pain. It was uh, it was a lot of fun, in fact. Yeah. Okay. We had huge, we had a great deal of fun. I know Matt and myself spent a lot of time talking over the period up to that big event where it was decided on how each of the invited nations, what their stance would be, where their red lines would be. I remember those sort of conversations. Stuff. There was a lot of fun in those yeah. conversations. There was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, right. Last question for today, and then we're calling it. Um, is there anything the ambassadors could do to administratively make your lives easier around treaties? Yes. <laughs> so if I, had the, if I had a couple of points um, don't try and write them in legalese oh, uh, Matt God. talked oh, earlier yeah. about how the uh, how the constitution was written as a set of principles mm. um, it is much better if you lay things out pretty clearly uh, with a sort of we're going to be allies, nobody's going to attack anybody else, we're going to do whatever and then work out the details later with, with NPCs about specific things largely due to the fact that there's no legal body outside the empire you can appeal to if somebody breaks a treaty yeah. don't, yeah. don't, don't try and trick us with funny and interesting wording because we won't be able to implement your trick one of the uh, things that made the Great Forest Orc um, treaty tricky to work through is that it was long and had lots of sub clauses trying to cover every eventuality yeah uh, in yeah, my memory, anyway. And that just made it very hard for us. The first step we had to do was then try and summarise that into a series of bullet points that we could talk about easily. Yes. Um, the other thing is, it won't stop you passing a treaty through the Senate, but it is really useful if we get to cast eyes over the actual wording of the treaty that you're going to be submitting. Because we are much more likely to be able to spot a problem, potentially, or a... Or a or a place where it's not clear what's going on, or a mis or a mistake even, um, and tell you, uh, and it's more satisfying for us to do that than after the fact saying, "Really sorry, but this treaty you've passed, this bit of it, is unconstitutional." Yeah, yeah. So there's two, the two worst case scenarios are one, we notice that your that the work that your treaty is unconstitutional after you've passed it through the Senate. That's a disaster for you. It's a disaster for us. So if you want to help us, please, God, give us plenty of time to look at the wording before you bring it up. And I know that's really hard because it's a, it's a weekend event and there's, a, you know, nothing gets signed till the last minute. And there are, you know, <laughs> there are really interesting comparisons between Empire and the real world about how no treaty gets signed till the last minute. And the reason why no treaty gets signed till the last minute is it's because only impending catastrophe forces people to compromise and it's compromise that is needed to sign a treaty so no treaty gets signed till the last minute and um you know that that does make things very pressured for time but please 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 um let us see it before you you submit it to senate and then the other thing is please make sure that, that a copy a carefully oh, a copy is kept afterwards I realise perhaps people think we're just uh, infinitely capable of reproducing every word spoken in the game onto the wiki, but we're not. Uh, so please, 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 please make sure we have a nice, good quality copy of it that we can put a picture of it on the wiki and then we can transcribe all the words and everyone can go, yes, 
that's the thing we all agreed um, so that's what would help us cool thank you everyone that was a lot of fun i really enjoyed chatting about that i always enjoy chatting about empire weird person that i am right is that as uh, yeah that that's us i'd like to thank you all for joining us and, uh, yeah uh, and we should all go out on a bye. If we can wait for about 10 seconds, that will make it easier for me to edit it. Bye. Bye. Bye.